And I will never understand how musicians get done what they do. I uh, was called in the office before the service. Sean needed me to change the toner and the printer and had to get all this stuff done so that he could print out the lyrics. And for the life of me, Sean, you just stood over here and yelled, yay, wasn't it? <laughs> we, we really needed to print that out that badly? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm, I, I admit I don't get it. I don't know how they do what they do, but it was really crucial to print that right that minute. So. I couldn't do it. Trust me. I, I respect it. But, uh, if Dr. Trobish were here, and by the way, I got an email from him last night wishing everyone hello and good health. He's in Vienna now working on uh, another biblical project, but uh, what he would have me tell you about this text before I read it is that it's uh, translated, in verse 3 it says, Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion. Uh, the word in Greek there is syzygous, which is actually a woman's name, uh, and it, it means my spouse. Uh, and so David has written an entire book on the life of Paul around the fact that Paul was married and that his wife, syzygous, lived in Philippi, which makes everything that he says about marriage in his letters to the Corinthian church far, far away seem rather more mean-spirited and hard to take. But uh, David would want you to know that this letter references the name of Paul's wife. He writes, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I also ask you, my syzygous, my spouse, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, for the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about those things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. If someone were to ask me what the most influential book that I've ever read was, given my profession, the only right answer would be the Bible, right? And it's kind of like when they asked George W. Bush who his favorite philosopher was, and, and he said, Jesus, which would mean either W. didn't know any philosophers, uh, or he assumed, considering his base, that Jesus was going to be a good answer. But once you remove Jesus and the Bible from that top list of candidates, there is for me a clear second place winner that's head and shoulders above every other book I ever read that changed my life. And it was not a book that I was assigned to read by any of my college professors, possibly even one that my professors wouldn't have been very happy that I was reading because it was always sold in the self-help section of bookstores. The book that influenced my adult development the most, the book that made me seek out personal conversations with the author and shaped a lot of my understanding of spirituality and ministry was M. Scott Peck's The Road Less Traveled. The book begins with a kind of Buddhist profundity saying, life is difficult. This is a great truth, one of the greatest truths. It is a great truth because once we truly see this truth, we transcend it. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we understand and accept that fact, then it's no longer difficult. 
Because once it is accepted, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. Now, Scott Peck saw himself as a scientist who was trying to join hands with spirituality. He was a scientist first who discovered a spiritual life, and he was trying to write a book that allowed a scientific age to take a new approach to spirituality. But I frankly think one of his greatest contributions was being able uh, to take his growing Christian awareness and use that to interpret Buddhist tradition. He does combine science and spirituality, but he also beautifully combines Christianity and Buddhism. I think that Jesus was a radical idealist and that Buddha was, in many ways, a radical realist. Buddha taught his disciples acceptance, emptying. Buddha said that your suffering comes because you have expectations and you have desires. If you would just let go of those, if you would empty yourself of all expectation and desire, you could accept the suffering of life and it no longer matters. Jesus, on the other hand, if you take his teaching seriously, makes it seem like the status quo is entirely unacceptable. It's slated for destruction. Jesus is such an idealist that he demands that anyone who takes his teaching seriously march right out that door and go change the world. Buddha tells us to accept things the way they are. Jesus tells us to change them. The two perspectives are not immediately compatible, but in a very paradoxical way, they complement and enlarge upon one another. In my pastoral role, I ask you to sacrifice on a weekly basis to give direct aid to the homeless, the hungry, the sick, and the oppressed. Buddha and Jesus would both applaud that. Buddha and Jesus would both agree on the spiritual value of compassion. But in the name of Jesus, I also ask you pastorally to join me in protesting in demonstrating, in speaking out, sometimes shaking a fist at rulers and sometimes throwing a rock at the palace because injustice should not be tolerated. I'm no expert on Buddhism, but I suspect that the Buddha would not likely join us at this afternoon's uh, uh, demonstration against the excesses of Wall Street. But I do suspect that if Buddha were here, he would tell those of us who were going to enjoy ourselves. That is a message you don't get from Jesus very often. Jesus doesn't seem to talk much about joy, and Buddha doesn't talk much about protest. My preaching professor at Vanderbilt was David Buttrick, and David was the son of the famous New York preacher George Buttrick, whose sermons first inspired Scott Peck to take the Christian religion seriously. And David, my, my professor, is brilliant, inspired, courageous, and I would say um, very, very, very angry, a very angry man. He's so angry at the way that the world is that in the decade during which I was a student of his, I don't think I ever saw him smile about anything. He told us that when we were preaching in our sermons, that we were never ever to tell a joke or elicit laughter from the church. He said, the powerful people in the world will always make fun of you, and the, and the marketplace will try to portray the church as being filled with clowns. So don't try to help them. Don't tell jokes and don't be funny. Your job as a preacher is dead serious, and it should be approached as a vital exercise. And, Dr. Buttrick, I do take preaching seriously. I continue to believe that there is nothing more potentially persuasive and life-changing than a live speaker before a live audience. However, I've had to accept that if all I ever offer you from this pulpit is information and anger, that you and I both will fall into despair. If we cannot learn to enjoy one another while we fight for social justice, we will give up on the fight. And I suspect most of us would give up pretty quickly. If you read the well-known verses from Psalm 23, 
if we were to read them slowly and just sort of let an image come to mind with each sentence. It's, it's kind of like a slideshow uh, that's gone crazy. It's kind of bizarre because the images don't really go together. It starts uh, with the image of uh, a peaceful shepherd and sheep in a green pasture and there's quiet water. Cause sheep are so skitterish that even if the stream's running too fast, they might not drink from it, but still water, quiet water, quiet, peaceful image. And then the Psalm, 23rd Psalm, ends with the image of being a servant in the king's palace. About as secure, if, if there's a food shortage everywhere in the kingdom, there's no shortage in the palace. If, if uh, every place else is full of crime and dangerous, not so in the palace. So it begins with you're a sheep and you're being well taken care of. It ends with you're one of the advisors and courtesans of the king and you get to live in the palace. But right in the middle, in the middle of the psalm, is this image about walking through the valley of the shadow of death, the dangerous place between two steep hills where the light never gets in. And if there's going to be a wild beast hiding or a criminal hiding to jump you, it's probably going to be right there where you can't defend yourself. This very contradictory image follows that about a feast being prepared in a battlefield. And if you can see uh, someone surrounded, you know, if you think of uh, uh, what was that Mel Gibson movie with his face painted blue and white? Uh, Braveheart. Braveheart. Yeah, I think, think of being surrounded by an enemy with swords and spears and arrows about to cut you down. He says, would you fill my wine up again? Fill it up till it overflows. There's this image of having a feast in the middle of a battlefield. The psalmist by this is acknowledging that life is full of danger. Life is difficult. More than that, there are people out there that really want to hurt you. you. You may be paranoid, but it is also true that there are people who want to hurt you, who want to stand in your way. He is surrounded by enemy forces, and yet he says, you know, it's Thanksgiving Day. Let's set up the table. Let me carve the turkey. Somebody open a few bottles of wine before we start the battle. I really think of our church that way lots of times. I do not see our worship services as being a retreat from the fight for social justice. This is not a sanctuary that becomes a hospital where we come to lick our wounds. I think of this as a place where we spread out the banquet tables to defiantly have a feast together in the presence of a very hostile world. Our church is now just over three years old, and virtually every week of our shared lives we have lived in the midst of the worst economic crisis, whose severity is not yet entirely revealed. Won't be for years until all the baby boomers begin to try to retire and find out that the losses that their pension plans suffered in the last decade will not allow them to retire. And a new generation of students graduate from school and find out that they can't get a job that will allow them to have health insurance and a car, and a place to live and eat. The crisis of our current economic downturn is yet to be fully revealed, but we can see it from here, and it's bad. Today, there are more than 2 million Americans who get up and go to work at Walmart. Most of them make about $8 an hour. But tomorrow morning, when their CEO, Michael Duke, goes to work, he will earn nearly $17,000 an hour. That's not 10 times an average worker. That's not 100 times. It's not even 1,000 times. It's more than 2,000 times as much as the average worker. Michael Duke, Michael Duke earns more than 2,000 of the people that are out running the cash registers, mopping the floors, and stocking the shelves. And if that doesn't make you kind of mad, then there's a cold, hard place where your heart's supposed to be. And yet the mainstream media keeps referencing the protests currently occupying Wall Street as being anti-capitalists who are encouraging class warfare. 
Now, Michael Duke is not really a great representative example, but I can tell you that in most nations of the world, CEOs make between 10 and 40 times as much as entry-level workers. That's, that's the average in most of the world. If you look at Japan or England or even Ecuador or Mexico, somewhere between 10 and 40 times as much as an average worker. But in the United States, the average stands at over 400. The CEO will make 400 times as much as an entry-level worker. I agree with Warren Buffett. Class warfare has been going on for a long time, and in any reasonable assessment, the rich have already won. The American media loves to go out into the Occupy Wall Street and interview the most radical and off-topic demonstrators that they can find on Wall Street. Some are bitterly opposed to capitalism and some have no idea why they're there. They tell reporters that they're there to stop the slaughter of animals for meat or to legalize marijuana. But if you listen to the international media, and I do, when they go out onto Wall Street and interview people, they interview physicians, veterans, professors, and writers. And they are very articulate people who know exactly why they're there. It's not that they're entirely against capitalism. It's that they are opposed to grotesque and abusive greed. They are against a government that is run by and for corporations. The rest of the world understands why we have demonstrators on Wall Street. It's only the mainstream American media that doesn't understand why they're there. One woman sign read, I'll believe that corporations are people when Texas executes one of them. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Buttrick. <laughs> I'm reminded of a history lesson I learned about the Great Wall of China, that from the time the Great Wall of China was constructed to the present, no enemy of China was ever able to invade by breaking down a portion of the wall and overrunning their border. But China has been successfully invaded each time when they bribe the Chinese gatekeepers. That it takes a moral corruption to break down a great nation, even when military strength is not enough. Our problem in America is not a lack of work ethic. It's not a shortage of ingenuity. Our problem isn't even capitalism. Our problem is unbridled greed and a population too frightened to organize well enough to defend themselves against the ravages of the powerful. Now, we as a church, we exist to speak the truth to power. The only reason why Springfield needed this church to come into existence is there was not a church willing to do what we say is our sole purpose, to speak the truth to power. We exist to be a prophetic voice that will tell the truth, preaching the good news of liberation to the poor and the factual truth of consequences to those who abuse the poor. I just think that we should enjoy the process. I think that being a part of a prophetic church ought to be something that we really get a lot of pleasure out of. There should be friendships that are born in this sanctuary as we prepare a table in the presence of our enemies. I think that the cup of joy should overflow even when we know that tomorrow morning we're going to be busy carrying out groceries to beat up old barely running cars of the poor who come to cross lines in need of groceries. Even though we know on Thursday morning when we go to Bill's place to feed the homeless that there's going to be a whole bunch of new faces that we've never seen before because they just got evicted. They just lost their job. They just ran out of family and friends that would feed them. And now they are dependent on the generosity of complete strangers. I'm happy to see that sometimes there is even the promise of new romance within our community. Romance that is born of having served with one another side by side in feeding the hungry, protesting the interest rates charged by payday loan businesses, and by seeking justice in God's kingdom. Men and women, I'm not kidding you. Life is difficult. 
and likely to become more difficult before it gets better. There are huge injustices in the world. It goes way beyond your father telling you that life isn't fair. It's much more than that because sometimes life is downright criminal. But we're not going to be defeated by that. It is, in fact, a beautiful day. A beautiful day for a demonstration. The Apostle Paul wrote in the, to the little church in Philippi that was already experiencing some rough challenges. And as, as often happens when a church is experiencing external conflict, they were starting to fight with each other. Paul writes to them insisting that they get along with one another. And then he waxes rather poetically, saying, Guys, life is difficult, but don't let yourselves worry about that fact. Pray, trust God, and let a peace that is bigger than all of our woes begin to live in you. Buddha would have said that. Jesus might have thought that Paul didn't understand the gravity of the situation, but Paul gives us some very sage advice. Don't be defeated by the stock market. Don't let months of unemployment paralyze a generous heart. Focus on what is good in life. If there is anything that is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, if you have any friends, if you've got any loving family, if you found a church that encourages you without insulting your intelligence, if you see any progress anywhere, Think about those things. And in the words of a more modern time, Paul, we'll get by with a little help from our friends. We're going to try with a little help from our friends. Thank you for being my friends. You encourage me to not lose hope. You inspire me to be more courageous, more honest, more prophetic. I love you, and because of you, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. It's a beautiful day. A beautiful day for us to go out and change the world. Amen. Amen.